Hey there, real estate enthusiasts. Welcome back to Invest in Square Feet, the show where we uncover the big ideas behind the buildings and the deals shaping our world. I'm your host, Matt Shields, and today we've got an episode that'll take you from Mile High Denver to the bright lights of Vegas. Joining us is the man with the plan, Jacob Vanderslice, who's here to share how a little thing like flight convenience and a lot of hands-on management can turn a good deal into a great one. I don't want to spoil the surprise, but it's not all just about snagging bargains. It's also about mastering the operations game. Buckle up as we dive into the nitty gritty of real estate success. We still have some uh, retail projects here around Denver, and we have a portfolio of single family rentals. We should have a lot more than we do relative to the number of deals we did. The, the discipline to not sell something and hold on to it for long-term wealth creation is, is tough sometimes, right? It's like, I can make it, I can get a hundred grand in cash by selling this house today, or I can leave a hundred grand in cash into the deal and lock it up and hold it in perpetuity. Yeah. Tough math equation sometimes, but I think wealth is created in real estate simply by buying assets and holding them for a long time. doesn't happen quickly. So we still have some single family rentals and we still have some retail, but our portfolio is, it's a cliche, but 98, 99% self storage. Yeah. I'm curious when you're looking at the long term holds like that are your lps on board with that because i know a lot of lps they like to get in and get out of these deals three to five years have you found an investor base that understands along your mindset where they're in it for the long haul or are you constantly up against that wall where sometimes you have to sell these assets because you have an investor base that is expecting the returns in a certain amount of time yeah, I'm going to, for a moment here, I'm going to talk out both sides of my mouth and, and open it up with uh, one of my favorite Churchill quotes, which is those who never change their minds, never change anything. And, and we change our minds constantly. So in most of our offerings, we've done three farms and then we have a variety of single asset syndications. And in our fund vehicles, our hold period guidance was six to eight years. Nowhere in our offering documents did it say we had to sell by year six, seven or eight for obvious reasons. But that was the rough estimated hold period. And in our single asset vehicles, those are generally five-year hold guidance. And in our second fund, which we closed out in, in late 2021, we've sold three deals after two and a half, three years. And that's a lot shorter, obviously, than the hold period guidance. And when we sell, and we certainly, when we sell before our kind of hold period guidance, there's a variety of reasons for it. Maybe we have a deal that's got a debt maturity and we're worried about refinancing. We can make good money if we sell it today. Other deals, we perceived that we had hit a value creation peak. We wanted to get a 2X multiple, say in six years, we get the same multiple by selling in two years. So does it make sense to monetize that? But generally, philosophically, we set the table with our investors that the guidance is not necessarily how long we're gonna hold the asset for. And what we endeavor to do within reason is return as much investor capital as we can from operational cash flow and refinance proceeds. And if you can return and de-risk most of your equity, whether it's a single asset deal or within a fund, I think the incentive to sell for both you and for your limited partners kind of diminishes because you're still enjoying the depreciation and the cash flow, just like your multifamily deal you're refinancing. And you're not, you're not killing the cash flow. You're not killing the golden goose. Mm -hmm. So there, I, I would say most of our investors are pretty clear that it's more of a medium, longer term volt strategy. And if it goes 10 years, hopefully that's for a good reason. And that's because we've returned all their capital and they still have ownership and they're still getting their benefits of depreciation and, and durable recurring distributions. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the, it, it sounds like you did all of the various different asset classes that potentially are out there. So talk a little bit about why you landed on self-storage as being your focus and moving away from all the other asset classes. Yeah, I'll tell you a few reasons first about the the risks and a couple of reasons why we don't like it and we, we do like it, but some of the downsides first. The main risk in self-storage is new supply. Self-storage is very local supply sensitive. So you can't prevent against this entirely, but if public storage builds a 100,000 foot facility next to you three years after you buy your facility, Mm -hmm. your, your occupancy and your rents are going to be negatively impacted. So that's a big risk factor is new supply. And we objectively and subjectively defend against that risk as much as we can by looking at zoning and building permits and concept reviews in the pipeline. But again, you can't stop somebody from building nearby you three years from now. So that's definitely a risk. Um, and a common misconception about self-storage 
if you compare it to multifamily is uh, multifamily and you've got, I'm going to sound like a, a heartless capitalist here, but maybe I am. Multifamily, you've got fair housing laws, uh, depending on the state eviction can be really cumbersome, right? It takes years to get somebody out, for example, in New York, whereas in self-storage, it's easier to remediate delinquency. However, the common misconception is that self-storage is not operationally intensive. It's no tenants, no toilets, no problem. And that could be not, it could not be further from the truth. It's a very operationally intensive asset class. And to a degree, we self-manage our whole portfolio. And to a degree, we're a retail facing business more so than we are a real estate investment company. We have hundreds of customers moving in and moving out every month. We have theft, we have break-ins, we have U-Hauls backing into gates. We've got people cooking meth. We've got people storing drug money. We probably get served with a DEA search warrant somewhere in the country, like monthly, because somebody's doing something bad and they got to get into their unit to investigate people not paying and having their units overlocked and getting upset. So it's very operationally intensive, but those are some of the negatives, but the positives are, first of all, we like the granularity of the revenue stream. So we're, we're relying on thousands of customers to pay us 30 to $300 a month. So we're not exposed to one giant user. Let's say we own an office building. It's really easy to knock office right now, but if you have an office building and you've got a 30,000 foot tenant and their lease expires or they get evicted or whatever the case is, it's going to take you a long time and cost you a lot of money to find a new tenant to, to go into that space. Whereas in storage, the guy paying a hundred bucks a month rolls over. We auction the contents, room clean the unit, and hopefully we put a customer in there who's going to pay. Mm -hmm. So we like the granular revenue stream that individually aren't meaningful, but when you have thousands of them, it becomes very meaningful. Um, and then secondly, we like the ability to, uh, dynamically manage our revenue. All the leases are month to month. So we can respond real time to supply and demand changes in a given sub market or a given facility. So if we have a unit type that's full, we can raise rents with a 30 day notice and probably not get a lot of move outs. And if we have a unit type that's lighter than we want to be on occupancy, we can drop rents below market, fill those units up and start increasing rates over time. So to a degree, it's a, it's an asset class you can experiment on and experiment within. If the experiment doesn't go well, you can course correct fairly quickly. Yeah. That's, I, I like the, the ability to be able to shift and fluctuate on the fly. Do you have a, I'm just curious if you have off the top of your head, some of the upper fluctuations that you have been able to achieve. And I'm just curious because obviously in, in, uh, multifamily, you're locked in for the year at whatever the market rate is, I'm assuming you're able to achieve that market rate. And I'm just curious, like if the market rate goes up, I don't know, $200, and I don't know if that goes up that much, are you able to, to shift people into that higher uh, price tier that quickly? Or do you, is there a cautious deployment of that to incrementally bring them up to wherever the market is at? I'm just curious how much that fluctuates or how hard you push that? Yeah, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of self-storage lingo here. There's a common abbreviation out there called an ECRI. And an ECRI stands for an existing customer rents increase. And the, the initial short answer to your question is, yes, we can do that, but it's got to be done very strategically and very gradually. So we look at the duration of tenancy for the given customer, how long have they been in the unit for? And then we look at competitor rates too. So if this guy's paying a hundred bucks a month for a 10 by 10. He's been in there for three years. Every other 10 by 10 that's similar climate control within three miles is leasing for $120. That customer can probably sustain a $15 increase. And it's very unlikely they're going to move out. What we're also doing, and, and we've never had a new idea in our lives, and this wasn't our new idea, but starting in the middle of 2023, what the larger operators started doing is they started discounting their move-in rates heavily compared to what they were before. And Historically, what you would do is more or less the advertised rate is the same rate the customer would pay. If they were still in the unit nine or 12 months later, they would get a nominal increase of maybe 10%. So what they started doing though, was that move-in rate was well below market to fill up units. And instead of waiting nine or 12 months, they would materially increase that customer's rate after three months. And we followed suit. And as we experimented with this and got our feet under us, we found that over 90% of our customers who have moved out after a rate increase were going to move out anyway. There was some event in their lives that caused them to not need that storage unit anymore. 
So we realized that these ECRIs didn't really affect the likelihood much of someone moving out after this ECRI or not. So we tried to ginger with it and, and tasteful with rate increases, but it's all unit by unit measuring the duration of the customer's tenancy, but also not so much percentages, but whole dollars. So if you're getting a, a $15 increase from $50 a month, that's a big increase, but in whole dollars, it's pretty nominal, right? Mm -hmm. But if you're getting a, a similar percentage increase and you're paying $300 a month, that might cause you to move out. So we look at our ECRIs, not only through the lens of percentages, but also the whole dollar increase as well. And we can measure our customer's reaction to all those increases. I mean, we're careful with it. We're tasteful. We're not, we're not cramming them too hard. But that's a big way that we create value in addition to leasing up vacant units is growing rents over time. And that's one of the ways we do it. Yeah. No, that makes sense. Talk a little bit about the value creation that you typically can create with a self-storage facility, right? You, so you purchase the property. What are some of the improvements that you typically can do that you've seen move the needle forward to, to bring in higher rents? Yeah. So you bought, I know I keep using this example, but you bought your multifamily deal in Columbus or sorry, in Cleveland back in 20, mm -hmm. right? Yep. And I assume you bought it with the perception that was probably accurate, that it was undermanaged, right? And you yep. had some work, rents are below market. So the strategy in self-storage is not this similar. We, we target acquisition opportunities where they're generally smaller operators. They don't do good with on, online advertising. Their rents are below market. And believe it or not, in self-storage, if you're 98% full, your rents are too low. You're not operating your property well if your occupancy is in the high 90s. So we'll target deals that are inefficiently managed. And beyond increasing rents over time and filling up vacant units, another way we, we add value from an NOI growth and revenue growth perspective is the implementation of ancillary income streams. So in multifamily, you might have a uh, utility bill X, right? The previous owner wasn't doing that. You separately meter each unit and you add a bunch to your NOI. In self-storage, our ancillary income streams are late fees, tenant insurance, which I'll go into a little more detail in a moment, but not too much detail. One-time administrative fees, U-Haul truck rentals, merchandise sales, and all these ancillary income streams comprise through last month across our entire portfolio about 11.5% of our top line revenue. So if we buy a deal that doesn't have those, and if we do nothing else in the first year, which we never do a lot more in the first year, but if we do nothing else, we can generally increase revenue by 10% just by bringing these ancillary income streams to bear. So to go back to the tenant insurance concept, when you travel and you rent a car, they're pushing that insurance on you pretty hard, but you probably decline because you have it on your auto policy or your Chase Sapphire card, whatever. But the margin on that insurance, which is why they push it so hard, is enormous. It's a huge margin. So in our case, we'll pay our carrier about $2 a month per unit in premium for coverage. Mm -hmm. And we'll charge our customers anywhere from $15 to $20 a month per unit for coverage. And that'll cover five to $10,000 worth of their contents. And to make the math easy, let's say you're netting 10 bucks a month. That's not a lot of money. But if you amortize that across 700 units in a given facility, you annualize that and you put a cap rate on it, you've created a lot of value by slinging that little $10 net income stream on a per unit basis. So ancillary income streams, revenue increases on existing customers that are below market, then the obvious one, which is taking an empty unit and making it full are all the ways that we grow NOI over time. And equally as important from the revenue side is the bottom line. If you're growing revenue, Harry pursue with your expenses, you're not a hero, right? right. Well, all of us, you, Listeners on this podcast right now, if we're buying a real estate deal, our singular focus is growing net operating income over time, right? That's all we're trying to do is grow NOI. And you have to be mindful of your expense load as you're growing revenue, because that can get away from you pretty quickly, wink, especially in Ohio with, with yeah. property. Yep. So the bottom line is as important as the top line, but with, with all these efforts, all of us are simply trying to grow NOI. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, let's jump into a little bit. Uh, talk a little bit about how you determine if a a property is desirable to to acquire, right? Like you mentioned before, you you get into all of the specifics uh, of what the planning boards and all of that is is planning for in the future. But what are some of the things that you look for in properties that make things stand out above other potential investment assets? Yeah, especially this year, we're really good at not closing. We have a great full-time team of acquisitions folks. And through about a month ago, 
we had looked at 882 possible wow. acquisition opportunities in 24. We financially modeled probably 250 and we closed on one. And wow. we've got a few deals in the pipeline that's going to improve that closing percentage, but only slightly. So it's a very wide funnel at the top and very narrow at the bottom. Generally, what we're looking for beyond your standard real estate fundamentals, like population growth, housing density, economic environment, is it a state that's growing? Is it, is it a state that people are moving out of? What you're first looking at are supply ratios. And supply ratios are expressed in square feet per capita. Nationally, there's about eight feet per capita of storage in, in the U.S. And some markets have much higher supply ratios. Other markets have lower supply ratios. So we're looking at the supply ratio for that given sub market. And we're looking mainly at not so much where the supply ratio is relative to the national average, but where the supply ratio is today relative to where it was three or four years ago. If you see a, if you see a market that's got a big supply ratio, maybe 20 feet per capita, based on what I just said, you might say that's not a good place to do storage deals. But if it's been 20 feet per capita for five years and all the facilities are 90% occupied, that, that can start to make sense. So what we don't want to see, and sometimes we miss this, but generally we catch it, is a market that's been 20 feet per capita for a long time. And based on deals that are in the development pipeline, it's going to go to 30 within 18 months if half of them get built. Uh, those markets are going to have some problems in the first couple of years of operations. Understanding the current and historic supply ratio is important. And quantifying the risk of the introduction of new supplies equally as important. And obviously we're looking at competitor rents. So what's a 10 by 10 going for in this five mile trade radius? Where has this owner ran their 10 by 10s at from a rent perspective the last couple of years? Is there a gap to close there that's reasonable with more effective management, more effective advertising and rebranding? And those are all the things we look for. Yeah, that's really interesting. When you go through and you create these your underwriting models and whatnot, are you looking for, I guess what my question is, what is your specific buy box that you're trying to, trying to achieve and say, this is a good project, or this is a property that we'd want to move forward with, like from size wise and, and all of that. And also you mentioned before about the, the density of the area, the supply per square foot per capita, what type of radius are you looking for that in obviously someplace like Denver? I'm sure there's pockets where it's higher and pockets where it's lower, but based on you know where the population is and all of that on each one of those sub markets, I, I'm assuming that you're factoring all of that into that equation. So just uh, yeah. dive into that a little bit. Yeah. The radius we're looking at is the one, three and five mile trade radius. The three and five are the most important. The one matters, but the three and five matter more to a degree. Once you're getting outside five, it's just too far for people to drive. It's not really a data point as much. As far as market selection goes, to a degree, we're geographically agnostic. If, if we're, if we own other deals in a given sub market, we try harder to get more deals there because we have economies of scale where we can amortize our fixed operating expenses against a larger asset base. When we buy a deal at a new market, we want a believable story to be able to buy more behind that one. Sometimes it doesn't happen like our Columbus, Ohio deal. We just haven't found opportunities up there. Our deal stands alone by itself. It's doing fine. But that was a market that we thought we'd get more than we haven't yet. So we try to cluster when we can. Um, as far as size goes and gross dollars, we, we don't really express our size with uh, a unit count. It's more of a net rentable square footage equation and a whole dollar equation. So if we're looking at a deal in a, an existing market we're already in, we might look at something as small as 25,000 net rentable square feet. If it's a deal in a market we're not already in. So for example, we're buying a deal in Vegas in about a month. We're not in Vegas yet. This one's about 32,000 feet, but it's really nice. It's a great story for value creation. That's on the smaller side of what we like to target, but we'll still do the deal. So generally 30,000 feet plus, the sweet spot's probably more like 50,000 feet on an average net rentable square footage size. Sometimes they're much larger, sometimes they're a little smaller. And as far as whole dollars go, it's really tough to justify doing a new deal, especially in a new market that's all in at less than 3 million. As you well know, and a lot of us probably listening, uh, doing a small deal takes as much and maybe even more time as doing a big deal. It's still dealing with the bank. It's still raising the money, putting together the PPM. All those things cost the same amount of money and time, whether it's a $15 million project or a $2 million project. So once you get below 3 million, the, the ROI on that time allocation kind of starts to diminish to a degree. So yeah, generally 30,000 feet plus, ideally larger and all in at 3 million. 
again, ideally much more than that. I'd say our average total project cost the last 18 months or so has been all in at seven or 8 million. We have some deals that are 25 million and we have some deals that are three. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Good, good. That's good information. When you are purchasing these smaller assets, talk a little bit about your strategy. Like you just mentioned the Vegas one. What's the strategy to be able to get the, 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 the feet on the ground, get the, uh, the operations established there? Are you going to hire an on-site property manager with, uh, with the intention of growing more assets there and scale out from there? Or how do you handle that when it's maybe a little bit too small for that on-site team or that on-site management team in the beginning? Yeah. So if we're based out of Denver and this deal is in Vegas, so you can imagine flights are pretty quick and pretty easy. And believe it or not, that's a factor sometimes when we think about these projects operationally, how long does it take you to get there? Is it a small airport and you have to drive two hours and it's two time zones away, or is it Vegas and the, the site's 20 minutes away from, from Harry Reid? That's a factor, believe it or not. We self-manage our entire portfolio. We have about 90 employees and over 70 of those are our various on-site and regional managers. And they are the people that create value in this portfolio. They're interacting with customers. They're dealing with vendors with repairs and maintenance and landscaping contracts and HVAC contracts. Um, and people say, you got to buy the deal, right? And I, I, I think I understand what that means to a degree. People talk about it all the time, but I've never bought a deal that I didn't feel like I paid too much for. Never, I, I, I don't want to say never, but I've almost never bought a deal. Oh, this is a home run. We're robbing this thing. High fives. I think what matters the most and what creates value in real estate is operational excellence who is managing that property, how they're executing, how they're growing revenue while controlling expenses. And that's where value is created. And that's why we still manage. We're not especially good at it, but we care a lot more and we pay a lot more attention to it than third parties do. And that's why we do it. But this one, it's from a management perspective, not to go too far into this Vegas deal, but it's newer construction. It's built 2021. It's multi-story elevator access, climate control, which is a kind of a must out there. And Repairs and maintenance on this, given the vintage and the quality, are going to be pretty low. It supports, it's big enough to support an onsite manager. We don't need to hire a regional manager for that area. We have someone who covers California already, so we can bounce back and forth on flights. So this one would stand alone by itself with basically one and a half employees in the market, a full-time and a part-time. Yeah, that's good. That's good information. I, uh, I always wondered that when you're expanding into new markets like that, how you would approach setting up that team. So yeah, I like that. I, and I imagine since it's such a new property too, there's probably a lot of, call it automation too, like maybe locks and all of that type of stuff where there's access to be able to get in there without having somebody actually present to be able to do a lot of things. Is that, yeah, we've, is that... we've experimented with remote management over the years and uh, we're, we're not that smart and our experiment failed. It just didn't go well. This is like way back in 2019. So some of our facilities will be run as satellite locations from a larger facility that's maybe a mile away. But all of our deals are staffed outside of those. And when you're looking at a climate controlled facility, I mentioned about, mentioned some of the problems we have with management and bad actors and theft and drugs and whatnot. If you don't have a person manning an interior climate controlled facility, bad things happen, right? Mm -hmm. Bad things happen when there's not someone there keeping an eye on it. So our customers can lease units, sign their leases, make their payments all online without interacting with our onsite manager. But we do have a person there that's present to solve problems if problems arise. Mm -hmm. And some customers want to interact with a person. I, I don't want to. When I go to Starbucks in the morning, I do a mobile order. I time it so I show up. It's on the counter. I, I leave and I go to work. I would do the same thing with a storage unit. But some people want to walk in and shoot the breeze with the on-site and make their payment with a crinkle check. Yep, and yep. Uh, we accommodate both sides. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. I feel like this is probably a good point now to, to be able to jump into what I was talking about earlier, the life crafting segment. And again, this is where we ask, what is the highest ROI activity that you have in your life? And again, some people go personal with this, other people go more tactile business uh, approach. So if I ask what, what is your highest ROI activity that you have in your life, what would you, what comes to mind? What do you think about that? Yeah, I'll go on the personal front uh, first here, and I won't go too deep into this, but last year I was drinking a lot of bourbon and not working out and got pretty heavy pretty quick. And I didn't feel like I was too heavy at the time, but I look at pictures from a year ago and I was like, man, how did that happen? My wife was making comments, 
So like we all do to a degree, January 1st, I'm like, all right, I'm not drinking for a while. I'm going to work out every day for a month and just see how it goes. And I did that and I kept it going and I haven't drank anything this year, which I deeply missed my bourbon. And I've worked out every single day this year, all year, mostly running, but some Peloton stuff. And it's a commitment and it's a time block for sure. And every time I go do a run in the afternoon, generally, I think about how much it's going to suck and it does every single time. But when you're done, most of us are going to say, very rarely do we ever say, I wish I wouldn't have worked out today. Unless you like mm-hmm. get an injury or something, it's pretty rare that you regret working out. And this is 101 basic stuff. We all know we should work out. We all know we should drink less. But I was an extreme case last year. And that's been transformational for my mental clarity, for my energy levels. I've got a stressful job running a real estate portfolio two little boys that are just out of control that are five and six. And I'm, I'm a much better version of myself today than I was uh, this time last year, for sure. On, on a more of a work front, I wish I had something transformational to say here, but all I could say is what's been meaningful for me is calendar blocking and calendar scheduling with scheduling links. I rolled out the scheduling link concept from our CRM probably three or four years ago. Somebody wanted to connect with a call and you're on the East coast. Think of how many times you've done this and probably all of us listening have done this. Oh, what time zone are you on? I could do one o'clock mountain slash three o'clock Eastern on this day of the week. And I rolled out the scheduling link. And my concern initially was that people were going to perceive me as a big deal. This guy is so full of himself that he makes me schedule a time to talk. And I pulled the first 10 or so people that actually booked calls and like, what'd you think of that? What was your perception? And I got resoundingly positive feedback. Oh, I loved it. It converts the time zone. We have to go back and forth. So that's been great for just finding time to connect with people. Hey, great to meet you via email. Love to talk to you. You can let me know what time that works or if easier, here's a customized link for you. They get on our scheduling page, they book a time, it auto generates a calendar invite and off we go. So that's been huge. And then blocking time on my calendar for thought and for tasks. I'm on the phone and in meetings for, and on Zoom for a big chunk of the day. And when you're doing that, you don't accomplish any tasks, right? You might move the needle forward. You might raise some money. You might make a new connection, but tasking this kind of falls by the wayside. So making time for thought and accomplishing tasks, I think is really important. And you do that just by calendar blocking and you make yourself do it. So those are two little tidbits on the work front that have been, that have been uh, pretty, pretty big for me. For sure. Yeah, I, I love it. And I, there, there's so many other questions that I want to ask about all of this stuff too, but I. What kind of just sticks out to me was with the calendar blocking and when you're setting up the time, the intentional time to, you either do a task or you're sitting there in the thought uh, type of process. I feel like for myself, I I try to do the exact same thing, but I find that I often will use it as a task. Like I, 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 I normally don't have the the ability to be able to say, okay, I'm going to sit here during this time and just think about everything that's going on or whatever I'm trying to solve. Like it always ends up being a task-based exercise. I might sit there for 10 minutes and think about this thing, but it always, you know, reverts over. I'll get a notification or whatever it might be, whatever happens, something pops in my mind and then I start going and doing that thing. And I'd like to be able to more be more intentional about the thought process and solving some of these problems that, that we might be dealing with. How have you found the best way for you to be able to designate that specific time that this is not going to be task-based? I'm not going to you know, go on the computer. I'm not going to solve these things. Or do you still have that same kind of challenge too, where again, you, you tend to be very tax, task-based most of the time? Matt, I, I have grossly misled you when I said that I make time to think. And I would say <laughs> 80% of that calendar blocking time, if not more, is task-based. Yeah. And that's something that I really got to drill down on. And I, I think about it constantly and I just get, end up getting sucked into a very detailed email response. It's going to take me 30 minutes to, to give this person information that they need on like performance or whatever the case might be, or a, a, a dumb banker who's confused about financials from years ago on a given project. But yeah, I have much to improve there, much to improve. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think a fair amount when I'm, when I'm on my afternoon runs. And I got some advice today from someone that I respect a lot. And she was like, if you're thinking on your runs, just pull out your iPhone and audio record your thoughts and, and then go back and make those into action. And okay, that's good. I've I've got one word dyspnea where I can only speak one word between breaths, but I'm going to try that out next time and, and see if it gets me anywhere. But like you, I have much to improve on the thought component of that calendar block and not as much to improve on the task run. 
Yeah. I, and one last question here too. Obviously you, you said how you're getting into exercising, you're getting into running and all of that. And it sounds like this was a hurdle for you in the beginning. I'm assuming that hurdle is not quite as high where now you're enjoying it. You're starting to see the benefits of it. Your, your energy level is higher and all of that, but any advice for people who might be struggling getting started with that, or they know that they have to do it and it's just always a mental block where, like you said, you hate doing it every day, but you go out and do it and then you feel great afterwards. I'm just curious what your thought process was when you got started to keep going and keep after that goal throughout the year. Was there any type of motivation or anything that comes to mind as far as a, just, just a drive or motivation to, to keep that, keep that habit moving forward? Before I answer that, let me first give you a thought on the real estate front that's in the same vein, and then I'll actually answer your question. So for those of us listening to this today, thinking, oh, I've always wanted to do a real estate deal. I've always wanted to get into real estate and I've gone to seminars, I've listened to podcasts, I've read books, but I've never taken action. My advice to you and take it for what it's worth, which isn't very much coming from me, but my advice to you is take a risk. The way you create wealth in real estate is through time. And if you're not in the game and you're in the sidelines, that wealth creation, that the, the years it takes to create that wealth, you're just missing. So find a sponsor, find a syndication, find a fund, find a rental property that you like and take action and learn because you'll never learn without doing. And on the workout front, it's so hard when you're starting from such a low place of physical fitness. And I'm, I'm talking like I'm a fitness guru and I'm far from it, but I've worked out every single day this year and it's mid-September and I've, I've seen the results and it's, it's something that I want to keep doing. But the, the first one is tough. The second one's tough. Third one's tough. It's miserable. And if you're trying to run or lifting or whatever, you're depressed about how slow you are. It's one of those things that you will see results and it's meaningful in so many different ways. If you have an Apple watch and you track your metrics, it's amazing what my metrics have done this year, like resting heart rate, DO2 max. It's just, it's, it's actually incredible. But like creating wealth in real estate, it takes a lot of time. And the way I approached it was no option. So today, I'm not going to drink and I have to work out. That was it. Just two things. Every day, wake up the next day. Today, you're not going to drink. You have to work out. Mm -hmm. There's no option. Some kind of meaningful workout and you're not going to go guzzle your bourbon sorry, at four o'clock. And, and so far, so good. We'll see if I win enough. I fall off the wagon, but day by day, like today, there's no option. I'm not going to drink and I'm going to, I'm going to go for a run today. Yeah. That's it. Congratulations on that. Yeah, that's a great mentality, great mindset to be able to approach that with. Yeah, uh, Jacob, not, not, a long, not a long term, just look at it daily, just daily goals. Yep. And daily yep. goals will be meaningful over time. Yeah, exactly. It, it adds up, it compounds for sure. If people want to learn more about you or any of the things that you are working on, how would they reach out and get in touch? Yeah, you know, we always love to talk shop about real estate, as you might have inferred from this conversation. People can go to our website, which is vanwestpartners.com. They can email me. Jacob at vanwestpartners.com or hit me on LinkedIn, Jacob Vandersless. Beautiful. Jacob, thanks for the, the time. This is fantastic conversation and you shared some good nuggets here for evaluating storage properties and whatnot. Some things that I didn't realize either. So thank you for that. Kind of blast, Matt. Thanks for having us on. Excellent. And that's a wrap on today's Invest in Square Feet. Big thanks to Jacob Vanderslice for dropping some serious knowledge on how to manage properties like a pro, even from hundreds of miles away. And it turns out the secret sauce isn't just in finding a great deal, but it's running it like a well-oiled machine. If this episode gave you some new tricks for your investing toolbox, be sure to hit the subscribe button and leave us a review. And tune in next time as we dive even deeper into the world of real estate. Until then, remember, you're only as good as your management game.